All right, so the next several uh, uh, lectures are, and weeks are going to be dedicated to the, uh, the Italian Renaissance. And when we talk about the Italian Renaissance, we're really talking about uh, the, the city that you're seeing on screen here, the, uh, the glorious city of Florence, Italy. Now, of course, there's many other um, you know, aspects that fall under the banner of the Renaissance um, from this time period and from other places, you know, Rome, um, the, uh, you know, the role of the Pope and all this, all very important. And of course, the spread of the Renaissance, its ideals and, and notions of, of art and beauty, they filter throughout all of Europe. But if you're talking about the, the heartbeat, the center of the, of the Renaissance, you're really talking about um, this, uh, the city of Florence. And one of the, the magnificent, magnificent things about Florence is that even when you visit it today, you know, 500 years after the, um, the height of the Italian Renaissance, it still feels very much like a Renaissance city. It's still dominated, as you can see here, by this um, uh, domed cathedral, the, what they call the Duomo, the uh, kind of the central church uh, itself, uh, an example of uh, a, a Italian uh, Renaissance architecture and, and art. And you walk these streets and you see all these red roof buildings. Um, it's very easy to kind of fool yourself that you're standing in a place and gone back in time uh, 500 years. Um, so we're going to get into, you know, the, the so-called kind of glories of the Renaissance, uh, you know, the art and the architecture is probably, you know, the things it's most famous for. But today we're going to kind of talk more about, um, what, you know, well, why Florence and what was going on that uh, kind of sparked this, um, this that uh, triggered this, um, these new movements in art and, and architecture and, and also personal wealth and the rise of a kind of middle class and an upper class and the like. And we're going to try to answer that question that we posed last week in is how can uh, a phoenix like this rise from the ashes of the, of the Trecento, of the 1400s, and um, give us something so remarkable? And it's not always a, a pretty story. And we're, today we're going to talk about a little more about the greediness of, uh, of, of this era and of this place and some of the things that had to happen to give rise to the, kind of the more you know, storied, mythical, beautiful things that we often associate with the, with the Renaissance. So, um, let's see if I can get my screen to advance here. There we go. Um, so we have, the Renaissance is marked by, uh, you know, the term itself means a rebirth. It's a, uh, a rediscovery of classical learning. That is, there, there, there's a rediscovery of um, Greco-Roman uh, texts, and so Greek and Latin texts that had, were, kind of went underground or kind of not lost necessarily, but forgotten, set aside, um, during the so-called medieval era, and uh, these texts start to be rediscovered. So philosophy, rhetoric, religion, um, and then also kind of uh, uh, standards of, of, of beauty and art uh, in painting and sculpture start to be rediscovered. Uh, and we, 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 the people in the Renaissance recognized that the Greeks and Romans were onto a lot of remarkable things that uh, kind of went underground for several hundred years, and now they're being reborn um, in this, this era. So uh, remember last time we were talking about kind of the, the schisms of the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church is still very dominant. The, the Pope is a force to be reckoned with during this era. But you remember that there started to be kind of a, uh, as I have here, kind of a thaw in the relationship between uh, the, the, the church, the Pope, and the people. And so you start to see kind of a split between what we may call a, a secular and a sacred. Um, and, and so you start to see kind of cities rise uh, under their own political power that's not necessarily tied to the church so much anymore. Um, it's still, like I said, a major game player. We'll see the church is the most preeminent patron of Italian Renaissance art. Um, and a lot of you know, famous artists from this era, Raphael, Botticelli, Michelangelo especially, a lot of them are making their, their living because of the money that the church is getting them to paint and to sculpt and the like. But you also see this rise of kind of the secular wealthy class that wants to um, to hire artists, uh, hire artists to paint things and sculpt things to beautify the mansions that they're building for themselves, or even um, in kind of a, a move of, of kind of civic good to uh, build and make beautiful things that will decorate the the public spaces of the city. And so, one of the things that happens to give rise to this is that as the 15th century kind of crawls out of the ashes of the 14th century. Um, these trade routes start to open up. Um, and uh, you have these wealthy families um, that are sitting on kind of piles of cash that start to kind of uh, take advantage of um, what's a kind of in an investment game. And so you, you, um, you invest in a ship 
that's going east. That's going to get spices from the, the Orient and to bring it back. And you put up a lot of money and you just hope that that one, that ship doesn't sink or it gets robbed by pirates. And if it comes back with its, its a cargo intact and you sell it, you stand to make a ton of money. So you have a number of these uh, kind of already w- fairly wealthy established families starting to kind of, you know, put their money out there to invest and to risk. And they become very powerful and very wealthy. And they start to use a lot of that money to commission uh, works, of, works of art. So, yeah, here's a map that kind of shows you there's this um, you know, revival of, of trade routes. Um, and uh, Italy, cities like Venice and, and Florence and Rome become hubs of this traffic. And you can see these, these trade routes st- uh, extending through North Africa and into the, the Arabian Peninsula, up into other parts of Europe, all throughout Asia and uh, Southeast Asia. And so you have these, uh, yeah, they're, you know, a, uh, not just a renaissance in art, but a renaissance in you know, shipbuilding and navigation. Um, you know, it's no accident that this is the same era that Columbus goes across the ocean. It's, a, it's an age of exploration, and so an age of daring and taking risks, so, you know, high risk, uh, high reward. Um, and then in, uh, so just to kind of zoom in on Italy here, you have you know, all of these various kind of mini, mini city-states. You know, we think today of, of, um, of Italy, uh, rightly so, as a unified country, you know, the entire boot here. But, um, you know, 500 years ago, it was really made up of all of these little mini states. And they all had their own governments. They all had their own coinage. They all had their own laws. And they were often very, uh, uh, very much at war with one another. So this is, um, I, again, the, the, the time of the Renaissance, yes, we rightly remember it for um, you know, these wondrous works of art and the like. But it was also a time of dark political machinations and backstabbings and backroom deals. And um, it was very, uh, a very dangerous time as well. But if you could play the game, you could become very influential and very, very powerful. So Florence, for example, right here in the middle, um, was its own city-state. And Florence, the city itself, was its, for lack of a better term, its capital. Um, and it's in Florence particularly, but in other places as well, you have this merchant class coming up. Um, and so some people have pointed to this era and this this area as a um, kind of a rise of, of kind of cutthroat capitalism as the world had not seen it before. And so in particular, this, the Medici family in Florence, which I'll talk more about in a second, um, they become very powerful, very wealthy uh, through banking and lending and charging interest. And they quickly kind of turn that, uh, that uh, monetary power into political power as well. Um, so yeah, so wealthy bankers and merchants are, are, are kind of piling up the cash, and they quickly want to show it off. And so uh, you, one of the ways you do this is you, um, you draw artists. You, you commission artists to come to Florence. If they're not already there, you lure them in with the promise of, of money and of status and a name. And soon Florence becomes this hub of, um, well, we, this, if you want to be an artist, if you want to make it, um, that's where you go. That's where the money is. That's where the action is. And so, yeah, artists coming together from different areas, they're sharing ideas, both, you know, deliberately and both kind of inadvertently. And so uh, you, out of this becomes this kind of cauldron of creativity and you're getting new techniques, new styles of arts, and they're building upon what the Greeks and Romans did and taking it in new directions as well. And so, yeah, uh, Florence, by far the most important of, of these city-states. Here's an uh, in, in old painting of it. Again, what's quite striking uh, is that um, the city still, you know, if you remove kind of the the, you know, the medieval walls, which the city no longer has. But if you take away those walls, it still pretty much looks the same to, to some degree. It really hasn't been, you know, modernized with skyscrapers and, and modern buildings, and, and deliberately so. Um, uh, you know, Florentines uh, today are very proud of this Renaissance heritage, and they want to keep their city embedded in that. So, yeah, the Medici family um, is, uh, without the Medici family, we really wouldn't have the, the Italian Renaissance as we know it today. Um, they are using their money to, to hire artists, um, to foster talent uh, in their own communities, to, to build, to design uh, their houses, local churches, public squares. Um, everybody, the Medici wanted to, everyone to kind of see uh, their status, but also they wanted to be benefactors for the city. Um, so the Medici, uh, uh, just a few details here. So kind of the grandfather, kind of the, the, um, the godfather of the Medici family is uh, Giovanni de' Medici. And um, he's the one who has the idea. He's a wool merchant, and he starts to do fairly um, uh, good business. And he decides that he's going to uh, uh, pool his money and uh, start a bank. And this is kind of the spark that um, uh, gives rise to their power. 
And so um, they, uh, before long, within a century, the Medici Bank becomes in some ways kind of the central bank of the Italian boot. Um, the, the florin, which was the coinage of Florence, becomes kind of the standard currency that everybody wants to trade in. And so um, it doesn't take a, a very long time before most investment money going in and out of, uh, of uh, Italy is flowing through a Medici bank. And they're collecting interests on all of these transactions. And so they're just becoming extraordinarily wealthy, with wealth to rival that even of the Catholic Church. Um, under Giovanni's son, Cosimo, and his great-grandson, Lorenzo, sometimes called Lorenzo the Great, um, this is the high point of the, uh, kind of the Medici's uh, influence in, in, in Florence. And to the, today in Florence, there's many of the buildings and churches and our artwork that you see comes from this era, from the patronage of these very wealth, wealthy and powerful men. And so for about the next 200 years, um, you know, kind of roughly from um, kind of the time of Lorenzo until, you know, the early part of this 18th century, uh, the Medici family is continuing to influence um, uh, politics and, and art and taste. Just so some examples, we're going to go into uh, details about each of, each of these in greater or lesser degree. Um, but one of the things that the Medici wanted to do was uh, for a long time, the, the, the cathedral um, in Florence had been left half built. And they built kind of the lower part and over here, which would cover kind of the altar and the, the pulpit where the, you know, the, um, the priest would, 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 uh, would stand, it was left uncovered because they had uh, built a, a church, but they did not have the engineering knowledge uh, on how to actually cap it with a dome. Um, they didn't know how to do it. I mean, that's kind of, in some sense, that's, in some ways, I like that detail as kind of an encapsulation of the Renaissance is that, I say, okay, no, we don't know how to build this dome yet, but we will soon. So kind of this extreme confidence in the way that was going. And so they, they built it, they started to build a church that they didn't even know how to finish. Well, uh, ultimately, this guy here, Filippo Brunelleschi, is the man who uh, is the man for the job. And he wins the commission. He actually figures out how to build uh, this incredible dome. And he uses all kinds of inventive uh, engineering techniques, which are illustrated here. But we'll go into more detail about him. It's a fascinating story in and of itself. Um, but that's that Renaissance spirit. Uh, we will figure this out. Um, and by exchanging ideas and by taking chances, by making mistakes, um, we will kind of push ever higher and higher. He also designs um, the Basilica of San Lorenzo, uh, which becomes kind of the local family church uh, for the Medici family. Um, other uh, artists, again, I'm going quickly because we'll talk more about these later. Uh, Masaccio is an early Renaissance artist um, who you can start to see some of those brilliant bright colors that we associate with a lot of Renaissance art. But he also starts to kind of rediscover um, perspective. You see these buildings in the background, they have a vanishing point. They give a... a um, a, uh, a, a painting some depth. And it had been a long time, we'll see uh, that this had happened, a medieval painting had been very, very flat, very two-dimensional. And suddenly we have kind of a, um, an artist kind of rediscovering things that the Greeks and Romans had figured out, but had long been lost. And of course, Michelangelo, which we'll be talking a lot about in the next coming weeks. Um, he's a Florentine himself, and um, his, uh, his stamp on the Renaissance is indelible. In fact, he's probably the one that we probably most associate with the Italian Renaissance. Here is his famous statue, David, which again, we'll take a, a closer look at uh, soon. Donatello, another early sculptor, uh, a tremendous influence on Michelangelo and others, um, also doing most of his, um, his important work in, um, in, uh, in Florence again. And then, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. You can't talk about the Italian Renaissance uh, without Leonardo. Leonardo is in, so, in some ways, I mean, you may have heard that term, like a Renaissance man, someone who can do it all. And Leonardo, uh, arguably even more than Michelangelo, he was, a, here's one of his paintings, the, the so-called Annunciation, it's in a gallery, and famous Uffizi Gallery in Florence today. Um, he was a painter, he was a sculptor, he was an inventor, he was a writer, he was a mathematician. Um, his uh, kind of genius, you know, comes along, you know, once in a, in a millennia, if that. And so we'll be talking a lot, about, a lot about Leonardo too, but Leonardo was not a Florentine. Um, he was born and grew up nearby but he did most, again, of his important work, uh, or not most of it, maybe, but a lot of it in Florence. Now, a bit of kind of a monkey wrench into all of this. Um, so that's, again, as I give you a little taste of kind of the so-called kind of glories of the Renaissance. Well, what was happening on the ground? And it wasn't all, um, you know, kind of beautiful red-tiled roofs and, and gorgeous domes and, and, and sculptures going up. There was lots of bumps and bruises along the way. And one of the famous uh, people, again, associated with Florence of this era is Girolamo Savonarola. 
and he's sometimes called the Mad Monk. But he was a, uh, a uh, yeah, he was a monk, a preacher, a reformer, who um, didn't like a lot of what he saw going on. He didn't like the secularization of Florence. He didn't like kind of the, the fading influence of the church. And he saw in a lot of this art and the way that, uh, you know, artists were tapping into not biblical themes, but uh, Greek and Roman themes, which were often, you know, highly erotic and sexualized. He says, this is decadence, and this is leading us down the wrong path. And um, he's, a, he's a, uh, a difficult person to pin down. And historians argue about, you know, what was he? Was he a kind of a preacher? Was he a madman? Was he a reformer? Was he ultimately a martyr to his own ideas? Was he a villain? Was he a hero? Let's talk a little bit about Savonarola. So he was born in Ferrara, uh, northern Italy, and um, he was a son of a, of, a, of a doctor who had some status and a, son who, a doctor who was also very, very much committed to the church. Um, the sources say that he wanted his son Girolamo to follow in his footsteps and to become a doctor. Um, so he goes off to school to do just that, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, agree with him. Uh, it's, he, he said, this is, not, uh, this is not my calling. And so he drops out, and much to his, do- his father's chagrin, he goes to a monastery. You know, it takes uh, vows of poverty and um, uh, kind of dedicates himself to the church. And particularly in response to what he saw, this growing humanism, the secularism is not right. Um, and he, uh, he saw what, all around him what he called the blind wickedness, wickedness of the Italian peoples. And he says, I, I, I can't take this. Somebody's got to speak out against this. This is going against God's will. Um, so he spends time, I mean, it takes a while before, you know, he becomes a kind of a flamethrower. Um, but uh, he quickly, the convent, um, sorry, the, the, uh, the monasteries recognize that this is a kid with talent. Um, he's, he's a fiery speaker. Um, he's a passionate man. And so in 1482, he is sent um, as a lecturer, just, you know, as a teacher to uh, a convent in, in Florence. And this is not uncommon. You know, he said, okay, you know, where can we use your talents? Why, you seem to be a great preacher, a teacher. Um, why don't you go to Florence and teach there? Um, and it's here where he claims that he has this revelation. And um, he starts to not just teach in the convent, you know, in a humble little position. He starts to make public speeches and sermons and he says, Florence, you're going down the path to hell. All of this decadence, this is not, this is not good. You know, God is going to, to punish you for this. And so he says, you need to, um, so he's like an, like, an old, like an Old Testament prophet. He's saying, you know, turn back to God now or, you know, face his wrath, you know, reform, scourge, renew. Um, and he quickly kind of divides the city in two. Many of people are drawn to him. He's very engaging. He's very much a, 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 um, a, a, uh, an attractive kind of demagogue, and people are, are saying maybe he has a, he has a um, he has a, a point here, and he seemed to kind of walk the walk the walk as well. Um, he did not um, he wasn't making backroom deals. He wasn't becoming wealthy. You know, he he kept to his vow of, of poverty, and dedicated himself to prayer and to um, uh, reading and studying scripture and uh, living kind of an ascetic lifestyle. And a lot of people are drawn to that. They're 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 um, they're uh, in awe of that. And so he starts to preach throughout uh, northern Italy, but ultimately he sees Florence as his, as his target, and he runs afoul of the Medici family, who of course are kind of bankrolling this new kind of secular, this new secular uh, world that they're they're um, kind of plunging into. Um, and so you know Lorenzo the Great, which was kind of one of his sparring partners at this time, dies, and some people declare the sign: you know, Savonarola lives, Lorenzo dies. It's clear who the winner is here. Um, he makes a prediction that Charles VIII, the French king, is going to invade, you know, as part of kind of, uh, you know, God will use him to kind of punish uh, uh, to Florence. And in 1494, Charles VIII indeed invades. So a lot of people said, he is a prophet. Um, he is, has kind of a direct line to God. Maybe we need to listen to what he has to say. Um, uh, and so there's lots of political unrest in the city. The, the Medici are, uh, for a short time, ousted from power. And um, a lot of that power is transferred to Savonarola. They say, you know, we no longer want, you know, kind of secular, wealthy families, run, uh, you know, uh, running the show anymore. Um, let's return to kind of a, uh, this idea that um, the spiritual man should have the temporal political power as well. And it seems that Savonarola kind of gets, gets wrapped up in this. And he, says, he sees, yes, let's, let's guide Florence uh, as kind of a beacon to other cities. And he called it, you know, we can make Florence a city of God, rather than a city of, of, uh, 
of darkness, and we can have a kind of a democratic republic, a, a kind of stirring of kind of a representative kind of democracy, but under the banner, uh, the banner um, of, of the deity uh, and Savonarola as his, his main mouthpiece. Well, news of this bleeds south to Rome, and um, he gains the attention of Alexander VI, who was the pope at the time. Now, Alexander VI was um, famously a scandalous pope. Um, he was not a, uh, a religious individual cut from the same cloth as Savonarola, not at all. He was using the papacy to line his own pockets. Um, there was uh, kind of very poorly held secrets that he was having uh, lots of affairs, that he was having children um, out of wedlock. Of course, you know, the, the pope is supposed to be remain the, the figurehead of, of, uh, of you know, uh, physical um, and, and well, spiritual and physical purity. And um, and uh, Savonarola makes you know uh, makes a big scandal of this and starts in his preaches um, he's he's talking about these things and this uh, of course infuriates Alexander and he bans Savonarola from teaching and preaching and um, but Savonarola basically says forget it you know um, God is on my side I'm going to do what I want and it gets so bad and Alexander recognizes the, the the power that Savonarola has is that he can't just simply snuff out this candle. So he tries to bribe him. He says, listen, you come to Rome, I'll make you a cardinal. And so the cardinal, kind of the rank of cardinal is the rank of, of um, uh, uh, Catholic priests that's just below the pope. And when a pope dies and, and there needs to be a new pope, you elect the new pope from the, the group of cardinals. And so he says, um, yeah, come on down, I'll, I'll make you a cardinal. And the cardinals wore these distinctive red robes and these distinctive red hats. And so Savonarola hears about this. He hears about this bribe. And he famously says, you know, you're offering me a red hat? I don't want a red hat. He says, I want a hat of blood. Basically saying, you know, I want to be, you know, if, if you're that serious, come and kill me, right? I'll be a martyr. I'll die for my ideas, and I'm not going to take your, I'm not, I'm not going to take your bribe. And so uh, Alexander uh, says, okay, I, I have no choice here. I'll, I'm going to excommunicate you from the church. I'll just cut you off. You're no longer um, uh, a Catholic, so to speak. And again, this day and age, of it's very serious business. To be excommunicated would be, in ordinary circumstances, to be kind of cut off from the rest of society. Um, it doesn't just mean you can't go to church anymore. It's basically you become a, a pariah in your own, uh, in your own uh, community. But of course, these are not ordinary times. And Savonarola amps this up, and he uh, encourages this event, which is now known as the Bonfire of the Vanities. And he's got lots of followers. He's got lots of, and Alexander recognized this, he's that you know, he has most of, of Florence kind of under his thumb and on his side. And Savonarola says, you know, you know the, all of these, these books and these paintings and these sculptures uh, and such, all of these things are, are just, uh, uh, they're vanities. They're distracting you from uh, communing with God. And so he encourages the people to kind of bring their, their books and their paintings and their, uh, their decorations and uh, everything that to him represented kind of the secular um, uh, decadence down to the public square and to burn it. And they have, there's this large bonfire where people kind of willingly throwing these, these things into the fire which, you know, from a secular historical point of view is a tremendous tragedy. We know that lots of, uh, you know, from our point of view today, priceless artworks, probably lots of books um, uh, that, w that only, you know, just a few copies uh, even existed were probably burned here and therefore lost forever. Um, but that seems to be kind of the tipping point. Um, Florence goes into a kind of depression. And we kind of realize with hindsight now that uh, Savonarola, he could kind of do what he, he could do as long as times were good. Um, I think this is kind of a truism is that, you know, people will kind of go along with a kind of revolutionary spirit as long as it doesn't really affect their bottom line all that much. I think that's a very kind of human kind of thing. And so when things start to go south in Florence, economically speaking, different rival factions start to pop up. And um, he... Uh, you know, Savonarola starts to make more claims and prophecies of miracles that don't necessarily seem to be come true, or he makes claims to, um, uh, to be able to perform miracles that nobody's really seen. And uh, a, a, another group of, of, of monks, um, so uh, Savonarola was a Dominican, which is a, a one, uh, you know, kind of um, branch of, of monastery. The Franciscans was another branch within the Catholic Church, and the Franciscans step up and, and, and challenge him. Say, so, okay, put your money where your mouth is, Savonarola. If you really are who you say you are, um, you'll undergo what they called a trial by fire. And basically what this was, um, was kind of testing 
testing one's uh, uh, supernatural ability. And they would build kind of this tunnel made out of, 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 of wood and set it on fire. And the idea is that, it, that if you are a, a, you know, a miracle man, if you really are a prophet, if you are touched by God, you could walk through this tunnel of fire. You know, kind of if you're familiar with kind of Old Testament um, tales like uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, the idea is that if God is on your side, he'll protect you, and you'll walk through the tunnel of flame untouched. And so they set this trial by fire, and, um, you know, Seven Rolls kind of backed himself into a corner. You know, if he says, no, I can't do that, well, he's made all of these claims. What's he going to do? And so on April 7th, 1492, you know, that date is, you know, the same year that's famously synonymous with Columbus's voyage. Um, he, uh, they arranged this in the, in the great public uh, piazza in Florence. And wouldn't you know, the day they have it, um, there's a thunderstorm and the rains come down and they're unable to kind of, you know, light the, uh, the, the fire tunnel. So some, some see this as kind of an absolute kind of, you know, bungled farce. Others see this, no, you know, this is God sent the rainstorm. You know, it's proof that Savonarola is who he says he is. Um, but it's, um, it's not, it's, 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 it's too late. Savonarola has kind of, he's, he's reached too far, he's gone too far, um, and the city ultimately uh, turns the tide against him. Look, there's a lot of, lot of details here that I'm, I'm skipping over for the sake of time. Um, but people had enough of him and of a lot of his unkept promises and a lot of his boasts. They storm the, um, the monastery of San Marco, they drag him out, and he is arrested. And um, he's got nowhere else to go. You know, uh, other factions are now in charge. Um, other kind of moneyed players are kind of stepping into the game. And he ultimately gets perhaps what he claimed he wanted to begin with, martyrdom. He's going to die for his ideals. Uh, but not before he's tortured. He, was, he underwent what was um, uh, many, many horrible things um, uh, that were done to, to prisoners, uh, particularly kind of political prisoners at the time. You know, unless we, again, unless we think of the Renaissance as just kind of a, a, a joyous time of art and invention and creativity, which it was, it was also a time of continued kind of medieval brutality as well. So we know that um, that uh, Savonarola was under, underwent what they called the, the what the, the what they called the strapato, um, which is what you see here. You know, you're tied up by your arms, I'm kind of behind you, and then they haul you up in this this horrible fashion. And what they would often do is just kind of they would also kind of um, suddenly give kind of slack in the ropes, so you drop down, and would put tremendous you know, would wrench your arms out of their sockets, um, just brutally, brutally, unbelievably painful um, and to get him to kind of confess, you know, that he was in the wrong and, and to, to um, recant many of these things that he said. Um, he never does, though. And he's kept up, locked in the tower here of the, of the tower here in the, in the main piazza at Florence, which still looks very much like it was today. Um, he was arrested with a, with a couple of, the, of, their, um, of, of monks that kind of went down with him. And they built this scaffolding and this um, this ramp out from the, the 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 building, which was you know was a political building, was also used as a, as a as a prison. And then they were kind of hung, uh, kind of a combination of being um, lynched, hung, but also kind of burned at the stake alive here at the end of the platform. Um, and this is the the, uh, the end of of, of Savonarola. Uh, here's the the square as it looks today. As you see that same building, there's the tower in which um, Savonarola was kept for a long time as a prisoner and, and in this building, or it might be a, a nearby building where he was tortured and, and uh, interrogated. But it's ultimately out in this square that you see here. Again, today decorated, these aren't originals, but copies of um, you know, famous uh, artworks by, uh, by Michelangelo and others. So kind of the square that represents kind of the, the heart of the, of the glories of the Renaissance also was the site of, of a continuing kind of brutality of the Renaissance as well. On the ground there in Florence today, there's this, um, there's this plaque on the ground, which marks the spot where Savonarola and uh, these two others were, um, were, uh, were executed in this brutal, brutal fashion. Here's a translation of it. It says, here between his fellow brothers Domenico Bonvicini and Silvestro Marufi on May 23rd, 1498, Girolamo Savonarola under an unjust sentence, notice that, was hanged and burned. After four centuries, this memorial was put in place. So even the memorial has kind of a, it's sympathetic to Savonarola and say that he kind of got a, a raw deal. That, uh, and so, uh, I mean, it's, like I said, historical opinion on Savonarola is divided. Um, and, and some people say that he's misunderstood, that he did have a, a, a righteous message to say, but he just, I mean, he went too far. And he uh, was ultimately executed, not because he deserved it, but because he ran afoul of the political um, factions of the day 
and just didn't know how to play that particular game. All right, now briefly, I, um, the, uh, the other thing I'm asking you to do this week besides, you know, um, do the readings and, and um, take the quiz and watch this lecture is to watch a, which I hope you find is a really fascinating documentary on this, this gentleman, Niccolo Machiavelli, who is also, you can see by his dates, the same, roughly the same era as, um, as Savonarola and um, overlaps with Michelangelo and others. Um, but he was not an artist. He was not a monk. He was a, um, you might say, kind of a political uh, philosopher. Some call him kind of the, the father of political science. Uh, but yes, a, a, a secular humanist, uh, a diplomat, a politician, a philosopher, a writer, a historian, another one of these, these grand kind of polymath Renaissance men that we associate with the Renaissance. Yeah, so the father of political science. He's famous for this, this, this basically this one book he wrote um, called The Prince. And um, he wrote it in 1513, although it didn't, um, it wasn't really published or didn't even circulate or gain popularity until after his death. So he was a political scientist, he was a philosopher, but he didn't seem to have a whole lot of influence in his, in his day. But it's this text here that uh, he becomes both famous and infamous for. And it's filled with very kind of stark, um, um, some would say immoral or conscienceless uh, uh, advice on how to gain power and how to keep power. And so in some ways, he's kind of the opposite of Savonarola. He doesn't come in with, um, as a kind of a religious firebrand. He says, no, um, you know, basically saying, what if all that spiritual business is, is, is bunk? Um, what if there is no God? What's the proof of God? And if there is no God, well, doesn't kind of anything go? And if anything goes, well, how do you live in a world like that? And the prince is full of advice on kind of how to live in a world like that. And so um, what I found here is, again, if you, if, if you Google Machiavelli and you click the images tab, what you'll often find is a lot of these little kind of pithy quotes from the prince that uh, purport to encapsulate his philosophy. And some of them, are, they're, they're pulled out of context. And as you'll see in the documentary, a lot of them have been misunderstood. But I'll, I'll walk through a few of them just to kind of give you a little taste of kind of who Machiavelli was, or at least the way we remember him. Since love and fear can hardly exist together, if we must choose between them, it is far safer to be feared than love. And so to um, keeping people in, uh, in fear is a much better way to control them, to have them do what you want, than to love them. You know, love is fickle, but fear has kind of a, a, a tangible, um, you know, edge to it, and is a much more um, potent political weapon. Uh, Machiavelli Golden Rule, the offenses one does to a man should not be such that one does not fear revenge for it, right? So know how far you can push people, but push people, right? And, um, and know, know, your, know your place, know, know who you're dealing with, but, you know, basically saying, yes, take advantage of other people, but make sure you take advantage of people who aren't going to have enough power to come back and take advantage of you. Uh, everyone sees what you appear to be, Few experience what you really are on this idea, you know, but you know, wear a mask, um, be cagey, be um, be subtle. Don't ever, don't ever kind of give away what you're really thinking. Um, you know, basically, you know, approach life as kind of a as a uh, ruthless poker player, and always kind of aware of masks. So everybody's always guessing what's behind the mask, but never give it away. Uh, politics have no relation to morals, right? So Machiavelli says, you know, forget what the church is saying. Um, basically, this idea you're not going to. You're not going to burn in hell. Um, he was very much a materialist, it seems, from the prince that says, you know, this is, this is all there is. So live as if this is all there is. And so, you know, don't worry about morality. That's just kind of a shell game that the church plays and has no bearing on um, reality. It is a double pleasure to deceive the deceiver, right? You know, so kind of life is kind of a game of thrones. In fact, in the document, you'll see um, uh, George R.R. R. Martin, uh, the author of the books that which Game of Thrones is based on, is interviewed and he talks about kind of how Machiavellian philosophy um, and, and politics were a big part of kind of how he, he kind of organized his own story. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, uh, just a little taste. Uh, you'll watch the documentary on, on Machiavelli. You get a much more kind of fleshed out picture of, of his life and his place in the Renaissance. And next week, we're going to be talking a lot more about um, kind of uh, the more maybe.